Welcome to Crossroads, everyone. This is a casual conversation with pastors and friends where we explore the intersection and especially the confrontation of our faith as Christians and the culture with this world. I'm Michael John, I'm the pastor of the Market Street Baptist Church here in Amesbury, and with me are my usual suspects here. We have Dave Hammer, pastor of Danville Baptist Church. Hello. And Rick Harrington, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Haverhill. Good to be Welcome here. back, man. Yes. All right, well today is October 18th. I don't know when this is gonna be aired, but today is October 18th, 2024. And in just 18 days, we will be going to the booths and voting and electing our 47th president of the United States, as well as an assortment of governors and senators and hundreds of representatives. Now I'm told, I keep hearing this again and again, that we are a sharply divided country and that we just, half the country despises the other half and, and we're, we're fighting things out. And we all seem, however, to agree, on, to agree on one thing, and that is that this is the most important election of our lifetime. And that if our candidate does not win, it will mean the end of America as we know it. It might even be the last election we will ever have. That's what I'm told, and we all agree upon that. Whether we're from the left to the right, Democrats or Republicans, if our guy doesn't win, it's over for America, isn't that correct? Well, that may be true, actually. It's always possible that America falls, even when we think everything is going well. Uh, Jesus did say in Luke 17 that, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be when he comes. They'll be eating and drinking and marrying, and even given in marriage until the day when he entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So a sense of security and peace is not necessarily a good thing. So whatever happens on November 5th, uh, let's not think for a minute that this means we have lost our country and if we lose or that we've saved our country if we win. We just don't know God's plans, but we'll find out. Still, elections do have consequences, and we are not just Christians and Christian pastors here. We are also American citizens, and we genuinely care about what is best for our families and our neighbors and our country and our future and our children. So for today, I'd like to take this time to reflect on politics and the Christian. And as Baptists, um, all three of us are, you know, we're, we're a contentious bunch, we're troublemakers, but we do have one good thing I think that we've brought to the church, and that is the notion of the separation of church and state. We believe very firmly in this as Baptists. And, um, and so we want to ask this question, what is the role of the church? And what is the role of the state? How are they different? Are there any points where they intersect? And how should Christians think about politics? Uh, should we be involved? And if so, in what ways? And, uh, and then I'll want to conclude with some thoughts for each of us here. Do we ever preach about, should we ever preach about political issues? And if so, how do we approach them? So let's start with part one, the roles of church and state. So gentlemen, this is for you to, to discuss with me here. The Apostle Paul describes the mission of the church in 2 Corinthians 15, 18 to 21, as a ministry of reconciliation. He says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. And he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God makes his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. So Dave, let's start with there for you. What, can you talk a little bit about what that means, just to get a sense of the role of the church uh -huh. in our world? What does he mean when he says, this is a, a ministry of reconciliation that we've been given? Uh -huh. <coughs> um, I think this is a great place to start because when I spend five minutes or a half hour on Twitter, I can just feel my, my blood pressure going up, that my, I'm getting a little hot under the collar, getting angry. And this, this helps me step back and say, okay, well, what, what matters most? Why, why am I here? What's the church all about? And we, we don't hear anywhere in there about the, our, the political party of our choice winning the election. So um, as God has called us as Christians uh, out of the world, saved us out of our, our blindness and our rebellion against him, he turns, even as he keeps transforming us into Christ's likeness, he sends us back into the world to, to love the world and to announce the salvation that's in Christ. That He gives us this ministry of reconciliation. And um, 
we're to do that no matter what political party is in power, no matter what government we're living mm -hmm. under. Um, that's God's primary interest for us. Jesus is building his church. He's not building mm -hmm. his political party or, or anything like that. And so um, I think that's just tremendously refreshing. It reminds me, hey, I, maybe I'm a little bit too caught up in what mm -hmm. people who don't know Christ are, are interested in or worried about. Mm -hmm. Rick, talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the, he talks about the message of reconciliation here. Mm -hmm. Can you just briefly tell us, what, what is the message of reconciliation? I think it's the ministry of the gospel. So the, the central message of the Christian faith that God has made man in his own image. We have rebelled against him in sin. He has sent his son, both God and man, who lives a sinless life of perfect love, dies on the cross in our place as a substitution, rises from the dead, calls all men everywhere to repent, believe, and be saved. Mm -hmm. So that gospel is to reach the ends of the earth, and we're called to make disciples of all the nations. That's the ministry of reconciliation, being reconciled to God through yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. But I'm just going to add, so, but <clears throat> I think it's interesting when you, you, you mentioned there, too, the, the separation of church and state. Um, sometimes that's misunderstood as the separation of, of God and state, or Christ and state, or Christian and state, none of which is being said. Uh, no Christian faith, as far as I understand, and that no like sort of denominational, or anything, would say that uh, God and Christian values of love and justice and so forth have no place mm. in, govern in government. Mm. It's the church has its unique mission, mm. which is different than the role of the state, which in the Bible has a clear mission as well. Uh, you know, so. Yeah, that's a great point. I think it's, I want to stress that too. It, it's, we're not saying by separation of church and state that the church and state are opposed to one another. They just have distinct roles. And, and so if I can quote um, Bill Belichick for a moment, it's like, do your job. Mm -hmm. So the, the church mm -hmm. has a job to do, and that in particular is the ministry of reconciliation. We want to have people be reconciled to God, to be forgiven of their sins, to have peace with God. Um, and that's a spiritual mission. It is not a political mission. Um, and so now I want to turn to, well, what's the role of the state in this? And I'm going to start with you, on, Rick, on this one here. Paul will say, okay, this is the lane for the church, so that we are the ministry of reconciliation, bringing peace, preaching the gospel, seeing people saved and brought to faith in Christ. And the beautiful thing about that is that political enemies uh, join the same family. Mm -hmm. There are many, there are a lot of believers, in fact, and when you look at the map of the world, the enemies of America are some of the fastest growing churches. Hmm. Like Iran is one of the fastest growing churches. North Korea, there is a vibrant church that is being severely persecuted in North Korea. China as well. Oh, yeah. Political enemies, and yet in Christ, we've been reconciled with believers there. So it transcends all of that. Now let's look at the state. Then what is, what is the purpose of the state? What, what are we to expect from the state? And to this I want to turn to Paul's description of the mission of the state. And I, I will title this one uh, a ministry of justice. This is Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Rick, why don't you start us off here and talk a little bit about what the state's role is. What is God's what has God ordained the government to do? It, you kind of summarized it well, Michael, when you said it's the ministry of justice, right? So the, the state bears the sword, meaning it has the ability to enforce uh, people to do good to, to, and to not do evil. So uh, we always should be very careful about what is legal and what is illegal. Uh, I think it's, it was it's G.K. Chesterton, great Catholic um, journalist, who said that to say something is illegal, it means that we should we are able to force them to do it or take away their freedom or even their life. I mean, that's what essentially it means for something to be legal, that, that, that we're going to in, uh, enforce it with whatever means necessary. So the government has that role to punish wrongdoing with a sword and to therefore encourage uh, doing what's right. That's the role of the state. And you don't want the, the state doing the role of the church, 
uh, specifically, not, you know, Christians. Christians should be involved in both of them, I think we're going to talk about. But mm. the church is doing the, you know, the ministry of reconciliation. So you don't want uh, the government saying, if you don't believe in Jesus, then you get the sword. Mm. No, we don't want that. Uh, nor do we want the church saying, you know, if you don't, um, you know, do what we're telling you to do and believe in Jesus, we're going to kill you, right? Yeah. So, so the government has the ability to bear the sword uniquely to enact justice, which really ultimately is to govern and to ensure peace. Yeah. It's essentially, you know, freedom and peace. That's kind of what their, their whole purpose is. So. Great, great. Dave, you want to add a little bit to that uh, regarding our relationship, though, as Christians now to the state. Let's say as, as a church, how, how do we relate to the state, mm -hmm. to the government? Um, yeah, th this is actually a surprising passage, I think, especially when you, as you read the New Testament, written in the first century, where, where the government, whether, whether uh, Christians in Jerusalem and Israel or even outside in the Roman Empire, are often frequently opposed by those in, with government authority. Mm -hmm. And then we come here and we read, uh, as I say surprisingly, that, that the authorities are God's uh, servants appointed by God and we're to, Christians are to submit to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so this this even it would include evil evil doing um, leaders of, of nations, um, and so well the, you know there's there's the difficult circumstance where they might force want you to do evil. Okay, then that's something we could talk about. How do Christians handle that? But the yeah. general disposition of Christians um, is ought to be one of respect and and submission. Um, and as, as as Paul write to to Timothy, we're to be praying for them. Mm. Um, you know so. Instead of just if say the person was opposed to Christianity, and so in many ways we, we are going to need to oppose them in some ways. Even there, our disposition needs to be first of all that we want to honor them, even if need be, we voice uh, disagreement with them. Yeah, that's a good word. That's a good word. And I know that uh, during COVID, which seems like decades ago now, it's, but uh, uh, such a sharp disagreement within the churches. How do we relate to the state when the state starts making demands? and start shutting down our churches, you know, how far do you submit to that? How far do you, and at what point do you resist? We're in a unique situation that Paul wasn't addressing in that we, we don't live in an in a empire with an emperor who can, who's above the law. We mm -hmm. live as a republic under the Constitution. And so I know many Christians were saying, you know, I am submitting when I am resisting unconstitutional authority. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's another mm -hmm. debate. Yeah, right, right, yeah. That's for another time. Maybe the next uh, crossroads we can get <laughs> yeah, to that. Right, but I don't want to get yeah, there yet. Right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about where the church and state might intersect. And so I have several questions on that. So um, given that, all right, so the church is in this lane of, of reconciliation. We're seeking, uh, it's our number one priority, even at the, at the expense of our own rights, uh, even at the expense of our own um, uh, political losses, even mm -hmm. as Paul and, and, and the apostles certainly had no power in the, in the Roman Emperor and suffered greatly because of it, yet, but their focus was on the gospel reconcil being reconciled. And then the, the state, whose job is to keep the order, keep the peace. And in fact, it's interesting, you mentioned the Timothy passage where he says, pray for all those in authority, and he says, this is why you pray for them authority, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives, so that the that will be the best backdrop for the gospel ministry of reconciliation yeah. because when people are anxious and stressed and there's chaos, it's hard to give the gospel a good hearing. And so yeah. we want to pray for that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, back to you, Dave, here. So yeah. in, in general, what would you say to this question here? Should Christians be involved then in political movements? Mm -hmm. And by political movements, uh, we mean getting certain legislation passed or certain mm -hmm. politicians elected? Um, should they ever run for office or be directly involved in a political campaign? What are your thoughts on that? So, I mean, if, if we think about politics as the, the enterprise in which people figure out how to live together well, um, Christians are supposed to love their neighbors. You know, th that's part of that ministry of reconciliation. That's part of bringing the love and truth of God to the world. And so, I think we all have different callings, different um, uh, abilities, interests, and so forth. But um, to the to the to the extent that they are able and and interested, Christians should be engaged. Absolutely. I mean, I think it would be 
it would certainly be wrong to say Christians should not be involved. I wouldn't, I, neither would I say Christians must be involved mm. in, in, in politics. Um, Christians certainly should not be co-opted by any other lord or dominant ideology or ethical system which is opposed in any way to Christianity. Mm. So we should do it as Christians for the common good as, as, as much as we're able and interested mm. to do so. Would you agree with that, Rick? Yeah, I, I think the way you worded the question is crucial, but I agree with it and I agree with what Dave said. You said should Christians, you didn't say should the church. Mm. So individual Christians That's absolutely cool. should be involved. In fact, many, many politicians are Christians. Many people serve in the military are Christians, but many, you know, uh, we've had almost every president um, we've had in I don't know how many years has at least claimed to be a professing Christian. So um, to say a Christian shouldn't be in politics, I mean, Christians are and a representative of a large part, portion of politics. And should an individual Christian sort of take seriously their call as an American citizen? What is their role? How should I be engaged? I think, I agree with Dave, uh, it differs to the amount. You know, someone may say, hey, my, my responsibility in politics is to vote you know, once a year, whatever it is. Another said, no, I, I, feel, I feel called to be more actively involved, maybe even campaign, maybe even um, either run for office or, or support a candidate more clearly because of certain things about that. Yeah, absolutely. Christians are made disciples by the church and then go and serve in all different capacities. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that too. I think the, the question of should Christians be involved in politics or even be politicians is like saying should Christians be teachers? Should they be firemen? Should they be policemen? Should they be restaurant owners and servants of different sorts? Yeah. And the whole thing of the, the, the ministries, there are so many various ministries that God has given to us and uh, there's a role for that. that. We need people to write the laws. We need people to maintain the order and the peace. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you can imagine, Michael, if you had uh, a congressman as, as a member of your church, you wouldn't yeah. say you can't be involved in politics. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's his life. Well, that's it depends on what party. <laughs> is. Just kidding. Um, do you have any pastoral concerns, Rick, for those who are involved or who would like to be involved in politics? Yes, definitely. So okay. there is a, definitely a way to shepherd and, and, and to sort of help them think through these issues. And I think that's what I would do. We'll we get this later on, but I wouldn't tell them uh, if, if there was someone who was serving, in, even in local politics, I wouldn't tell them how they should vote, what issues they should, you know, campaign on or something like that. I would try to guide them to biblical principles as to, you know, what does the Bible say is of greatest importance. And um, being careful not to let politics become an idol where it becomes more important mm -hmm. than everything. Yeah. And as if that's, like you said, if, if my party wins, then that's we're going to save the world, to save America. Yeah. Um, uh, it doesn't work like that, right? The gospel is central to our whole you know, focus So, uh, as, as, to what, as to what reconciles the world. So I would definitely try to guide that person, depending on what his or her specific position is in and what, what questions they're at, you know, what, how much they allow me to speak into their life. If they're asking me, hmm. hey, I'm, I got this big issue. I'm facing, or if it's just an individual who you know is is just really campaigning, or you know really involved in it, uh, like let's say someone who's just constantly watching cable news and it's obs they're obsessed with it, I would definitely have some advice for that person too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. How about yourself, Dave? Do you have any pastoral concerns uh, for those involved? I, I think a good verse might be uh, <coughs> Jesus' words: "What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul?" So. Um, if, if for the, the politician or the, the political junkie in our mm -hmm. church um, who's, who's very involved and they're, you know, they're getting more and more into their cause and their side, um, I might want to remind them of that, that mm. your soul and particularly your relationship with God and your standing with, before Him, um, that that's most important. And if that becomes jeopardized, if that gets put in second or third place to the political movement you're a part of, then then you've got mm. things out of perspective. Um, I think that'd be at least one of the main things. And, I, and you know, I think we see th that uh, lack of priorities a lot nowadays, yeah. where where uh, people I think are a lot more interested in their political party, th some Christians, than their walk with Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that is a concern, and that, that's not even people that are actually the politicians, that's yeah. just from the armchair quarterbacks. Yeah, so. yeah, and I would add to that just the, the constant concern, the um, anxiety and anger would be the two uh -huh. things I would just be, we need to be constant Good. on constant guard with. Good. You know, um, I think that's what, it happens to us, we feel that way, we see the outrage of it, we 
feel and that uh, the devil can use these things, even if it's a righteous cause, but that, that feeling of anxiety, that fear, and then the anger that accompanies it as you, especially if the things that you're, you're hoping will happen don't happen, or you feel you've been cheated in some way, and, and it happens. Cheating happens all the time. Um, there's a whole history of it, but, but that anxiety and anger, there's no, that's the devil's cocaine in a sense. It's like, okay. it's really, you mm -hmm. gotta be careful okay. with that. That's really so. good. Interesting you mentioned the cocaine, because, um, you know, Marx famously said that religion is the opiate of the masses, yeah. meaning it, 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 you know, sort of numbs us to the class, class, you know. But really, it's in many ways, politics is the opiate of the masses, right? It's what mm. people spend all their energy and focus and uh, just their anger and their emotion towards. And honestly, they have very little effect upon, right? It's just, it's just, so yeah. they're, I can't believe that this candidate said this. I can't believe what she did. And really has nothing to do with their lives. Has no real effect, but it's, they're letting it yeah. sort of overtake their life. And I think there's definitely a pastoral yeah. sort of responsibility to Good. say, hey, man, yeah. you're a sovereign God. You, yeah. have, you have a family to take care of. Yeah. You have a community to care for, you know. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Be careful. All right, now the, the, the controversial question is this. Is, okay. is there ever a time for a local church to be involved in politics? Oh, yes. You're, you're asking me? Oh, yeah, okay. Of course. I, I would say I, uh, yes, but it's, it's not a go-to. Uh, um, there, are, there are occasions where I think there is something so gre egregious, something so immoral that it would be wrong for the church to be silent on those things. Uh, a clear example would be, you know, World War II, what was happening in, in Germany, that in many ways, I, I, you know, I just complimented a Catholic, so I can now bash, the, the Catholic Church kind of stood by and, um, and for, will forever, I think, have to bear the blame that they were not willing to speak out, they even sort of, um, maybe even kind of supported some of what was ha happening there. So what a shame, you know, when there's anti-Semitism and things like that that are being enshrined by the government and that people aren't willing to speak out. Another great example would be abolition. A lot of churches spoke out against, um, you know, slavery, and I think that was a place to do that. If they were, their silence would have spoken loud, more loudly um, than, than anything. So they, there was a place for them to say something. Yeah. All right, so uh, Dave, I'm gonna ask you this question then as a follow-up to Rick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm following up his question, his answer okay, okay, <laughs> to yeah, you. Yeah. So you're gonna have to give an answer for this one here. He mentioned two things, the Holocaust mm -hmm. and slavery, two issues mm -hmm. that we're not talking about today. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about, but that are not issues really. Mm -hmm. There is no slavery uh, and there is no Holocaust, at least that we're aware of at the moment. However, um, is there an issue today that the church should be addressing? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things, not necessarily in the political arena. I'm trying to think of how, but that's what we're, what we're talking about. Um, so, you know, I mean, th there are certainly views about, about human sexuality that are very relevant cultural issues. Now, to what extent should, the ch should churches be seeking to use political mechanisms you know, machinations for to, related to that. I'm not sure. A abortion, I think, is another one, and I think the church should. Uh, it, you know, it, it's really one of the th one of the key things. Like uh, if this relates to what Rick is saying is the more clear the biblical issue is, the more I think there is uh, the the right the the really a mandate for the church to speak up. So, yeah, I I think that's one thing that's helpful. Yeah, that I, I yeah. just think that's a good principle. Yeah. Should a um, should a church um, promote uh, a specific candidate or party because that candidate or party um, agrees or is in align with the values of the church? Rick? Me, yeah, I, I would say again, I don't want to give a hard no because I can imagine a situation in which they they might like World War II. But um, in, the, in our current political situation, I don't think there is any reason to do that. I don't think there's any reason to choose a particular party or, a, a, or a, I think it would be more damaging to advocate for a particular candidate in the federal presidential situation anyway, mm -hmm. um, we're talking here. Um, but I can't, I, I don't wanna give a hard no. I mean, there may be where you have someone who is so, um, uh, like an Adolf Hitler situation, which the, the, the church must speak up. They must, ha they must take a stance on that. Um, I don't think that is the current situation, though. Okay. So, yeah. What if he's a member of your church? What if you have a, a man who is, or a woman who is a member of your church hmm. and uh, running for office? Hmm. 
Yeah, I still wouldn't. I would still wouldn't try to no. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, how about this one here? I, I, I've recently been thinking about uh, it's not in your notes here. It's a little. Let's see how sharp hmm. you guys are. <laughs> so you know that if this doesn't go well, it wasn't in the notes. <laughs> But I, uh, voter guides. I used to be, um, I remember when I first came to church, it was very common to receive voter guides for, for Christians. Sort of like, these are the issues. This is where the candidates stand on each of the issues. Mm -hmm. uh, you decide what you want to do. But it's obvious what we were, you know, what we're hoping to do. We had certain candidates and parties in mind. How do you feel about voter guides today? Would you, do you use them or would you use them? I've never been a part of a church that did, and I could would certainly have be concerned about how that would be laid out. I can imagine it being done well, and I also could imagine it being done mm -hmm. po poorly. How about you, Rick? Ever yeah. this? Similar to Dave, I would say that um, it, it would be a question of right or wrong, but of prudence or impr imprudence. I think yeah. it, would it be wise to do that? Um, are you are you tipping your? Are you basically becoming a a, a tool for a particular party? Is it? that obvious or are you really just trying to say hey we want people to vote and we want them to be informed and, and here here's what this is um, so I, I don't think I would do it at my church but I'm, I wouldn't again I wouldn't want to say it's it's wrong in every case okay. I don't mean just be so nebulous but when it comes to political issues there is sort of a you know it's not always a clear black and white how we approach yeah. it so yeah it's interesting times we, we are it's like you know, you're walking on eggs and you begin to wonder the wisdom of things, and I think as we're going to get to the next section, my concern is not so much the morality versus immorality as it is just wisdom uh, versus kind of being a little foolish and, and unnecessary problems for yourself. And so depending on the climate, I mean, we're in a climate right now, uh, politics have become so divisive and so that to, you have to be so careful stepping into it because it's, it, can, it can negatively affect our work, which is not the ministry of justice, it's the ministry of reconciliation. And we don't want to destroy what we've been called to do in order to pursue, you know, what is a, you know, maybe a noble cause. Mm -hmm. So we have to be certainly wise about this. Yeah. All right, let's, let's get into some specific topics here. So here's some political issues here. So here's some of the top issues in this election, according to the Pew Research. Um, which of these issues should matter to Christians? And are there any that we must take a stand on? That if we don't speak to it and speak specifically to it, maybe we are um, in disobedience. All right. So the first one is the economy. That's the number one issue in this election, hmm. uh, as it is in pretty much every election. Um, are, should that matter to Christians as far as the economic policy of the candidates? Dave? You know, it, economics, all of these issues I think we we're going to mention, they're, they're complex. This is hugely complex. And um, I think one of the main things that we'd want our churches to know about this actually is uh, to put it in perspective and to realize its complexity. I think that any candidate who comes out and just says, I can fix it, or it's all, it's all caused by the other candidate, the problems are all, you know, Christians should not be so gullible as to believe either of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but we should care about the economy because we care about um, other people, because we love them. We, we want, we should care about the poor. Um, so we should care about that. But, uh, but uh, how much can, how intelligently can we speak into that? And it's not only that we can't necessarily speak that intelligently into it, but I think that the things that we are called to speak to, theology mm -hmm. and the Bible, are, are actually much more significant than the current economy of our of our country. So even though it matters, um, you know, I'm getting ready to preach on Hebrews chapter 2. And I think what it says in Hebrews chapter 2 about what Jesus has done and accomplished and who he is to us is way more important than anything that I could say about the economy, of which I'm actually not trained on anyway. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's some initial thoughts. Rick, is, is the economy morally neutral, that it doesn't really matter, or is, is there a moral element to it that we should consider? So, so I would say it is a moral issue, but I, I agree with Dave, it's, not, it's, it's a little bit more further removed. Again, the question you asked, Michael, was should Christians uh, be care, care about the economy? And the answer is 100% yes. Um, should the pastors preach on the economy or should the church take an official stance on the economy? That's a different question, right? So, um, and there are ways in which, you know, if we have a conversation, let's say we're sitting around, you know, sitting around a dinner table with a church member, we have a conversation about the economy. 
and you want to say, hey, you know, I think a free market economy um, is really the best, you know, I think you're free to, as a pastor to have that, those conversations. Mm. And you might even point to biblical principles like uh, First Thessalonians about, you know, man doesn't work, doesn't eat, there's a you know, yeah. responsibility yeah. on us. You could also point to things like care for the poor, is there a responsibility to care for? So you can have those conversations, I think. But I think I would be careful with a church, let's say we put out a, an official statement, we are, you know, Keynesian in our economic, you know, views, or we are, um, uh, what's the other one, Austrian in our, yeah, I, I, I don't think we need to take a stance. It's, it's something so removed from what the mission of the church that it doesn't necessarily have to. Now, the fact that people are struggling today I mean, I think I would address that in a sermon, no problem. I know these are hard times. There's inflation mm -hmm. is hurting. You know, this is, you know, how, how do we deal with that? How do we trust the Lord in these times? Mm -hmm. So th those issues and how they affect individuals, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, next one. Mm -hmm. Foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, should that concern Christians? Obviously, all these things are going to concern us, but uh, talk a little bit about that. How should a Christian think about foreign policy mm -hmm. in the election? Let's start with you, Rick. How should a Christian? Again. <laughs> yeah, how's a Christian, yeah. and maybe even, the, and maybe the church, okay. maybe the church too. Okay. We'll add it in there too. If if yeah. you feel like the church should address something there, um, like in particular foreign policy, I want to talk about Israel. Mm -hmm. okay. I know there are some churches that there's some belief that um, that if you are uh, against Israel, you are against God. Mm -hmm. So talk about that. Mm -hmm. Talk about foreign policy. Yeah. Policy. So again, I mean, I would have my own views, and I do think that they are based on a Christian perspective and some Christian sort of principles. But I don't know if I would take a stance as a church in the community for what we believe on. on, 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 on. Now, Israel is, is maybe a unique situation, uh, and we could talk about you know that separately if you want. Mm -hmm. But on just on on foreign policy, I have maybe even strong opinions about what needs to be done and America's place in the world. And uh, you know, it's interesting that. Five years ago, if somebody said, "Hey, we're in the you know World War III is around the corner," people would laugh at them. Now, everybody sees that as a, a legitimate situation yeah. we could be in, yeah. and many of us have folks in our congregations who are serving in the military. This affects them. Um, you know, uh, they've been you know, uh, I know one person's been shipped out to uh, to cross over to Europe because of what's going on in the Ukraine, most likely yeah. going on in Ukraine. So this does affect us, and it affects the people in our church. So again, I'd have no problem having a conversation with people around the dinner table and so forth. Would I preach on the, the what I believe is the correct view of, uh, of how we should approach foreign policy? Probably not, okay. and I probably wouldn't have an official statement. But discipleship affects all, I, I don't want to give the impression also that the Bible has nothing to say about these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not true either. You know, the biblical principles do apply to all different areas of life in different ways. And there's a prism, like I said, well, you can look at our, our need to care for the poor, you can look at personal responsibility, and both of them have a role, and you kind of figure out what's, you know, go, where to go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, you want to add that little foreign policy? <laughs> <laughs> You're an expert in this here. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with what Rick said. Um, Maybe I should just maybe I'll mention about Israel a little bit. Is um, is that I, I think that churches that um, preach about Israel in some way that the the church has a uh, a responsibility to national political Israel today. Um, I think they're making a big mistake. I think that it's natural for Christians who, who should care about all people, and when we see that as, as Christians, our background is connected with Jews. So we have, the, we have a heritage that can intersects with, with today's Jews. Uh, even as we were supposed to care about all people, I could see why we would want to, in particular, be interested in, in Jews uh, and in the nation of Israel. Having said that, we see throughout Scripture that um, that God, when the people of it, when the nation of Israel is not trusting in Him, He often chastises them by conquering them and so forth when they are unjust in things they do. Uh, he He chastises them. I wouldn't want to stand in God's way of that. Like here, God is, you, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what God is doing with that nation. Mm -hmm. I think that we, as Christians, uh, as responsible citizens, should want, should look over the, at the nation. We'd want them to know Christ, mm -hmm. so we want to evangelize them. But to give them a blank check and, and, and well, I mean, I don't know what we can do as, as individual citizens, but to yeah. try to promote political, uh, you know, actions which 
are always pro-Israel no matter what, I, I wouldn't want to do that. Even as I'm today aware, it's, it seems to me that um, one side of the aisle, it, it, it does tend to be anti-Israel. And I don't think that's good, that's good either. Okay. So those are that's good. maybe you're going a little further than no, that, and some, some would no, that's good. Some some would say I've heard this uh, in the church as well as that you know God didn't doesn't the scripture say that he who blesses mm. will be blessed, he who curses mm -hmm. will be cursed, and so don't we have an obli don't we have a spiritual obligation to bless Israel? Rick? Well, let me let me let me say um, well, I'll, I'll try to answer that question so I don't seem like I'm avoiding it. We, are, we desire that the, the Jewish people would come to know their Messiah mm. and Savior, Jesus, the same as us. Um, now that's gonna take a lot of love and time and the church has messed that up badly mm -hmm. over the years. So, um, but the ultimate goal is that they might hear about Jesus in a loving way that, is, you know, that he has come to save and redeem all people. Yeah. One thing I would just say that relates to this issue too with Israel um, is that some people say, well, we want peace and peace at all costs, and war itself is evil and wrong. Again, that has to do with the role of the state and the role yeah. of the church. It isn't always wrong mm -hmm. to, I mean, it's not peace at all costs. It's not, well, Israel is automatically in the wrong because they are killing people to er eradicate Hamas. Now, yeah. I'll leave it to, you know, uh, people to decide if they are in the wrong, but just, it doesn't, war itself is not necessarily, there's such a thing as just war. Mm -hmm. That's the role of the state, mm -hmm. and that, that exists, they, there is a place for the sword. And it's a danger for us as Christians to say, well, Jesus said turn the other cheek, uh, which is really applies to Christian ethics individually, and say, and therefore the role of the state must act in the same way. Mm. That, um, you know, a pacifistic kind of approach, which is, you know, some people are pacifists, some Christians are pacifists, but I don't think the Bible really advocates for that. Mm. So there, it, does Israel have a right to defend themselves? Yes, they're mm. a sovereign nation. Does do they have do um, should, it, it, should we as Christians condemn them for defending themselves? No, I don't think we should. Now whether they've done it, mm. overkill, whatever. However, that's those are discussions that should be have had, and and, and even Israel has admitted that they have at times failed. Sure. Um, but I don't think it's the church or or individual Christians' place to say they are wrong to, yeah. to go to war necessarily. Yeah. Necessarily. So yeah, yeah I, I find foreign policy the hardest one to navigate and I think where we need to be the most careful with because you're, you're dealing with situations we just don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you think you know because you get the news reports of who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, but we just don't know. These are complicated situations. There's a certain level of trust that we have to have in our leaders to navigate these decisions. Um, you know, because we're talking, you know, it's Ukraine, uh, and Russia, possibly with China and Taiwan, and now with the Palestinians and, yeah. and Iran and Israel, you know, there's a certain part in which we feel like, I, I think I know who the good guys are mm -hmm. and who the bad guys yeah. are, but there's so much happening on the ground, and there's so much wisdom and nuance to these things that we yeah. just have no access to. Yeah. So it's kind of, I, I encourage caution on those foreign Absolutely. policy issues because yeah. there's just Absolutely. too many unknowns. Um, so just hope that we have some qualified leaders who yeah. can navigate that. It's not that we don't have personal opinions on these things, but as yeah. far as like leading our church yeah. to one, you know. But how many, how many times have you taken a side in a, on, a, on an issue? Totally. And because you're basing it on the information you've been given, yeah. only realize that you've been lied to, that you've been scammed, yeah. and, you, and you, were, you were rooting for the wrong team. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll even name a specific example. When we invaded uh, Iraq, I was totally like, oh, that was the right thing to do. But in retrospect, there was a lot of reasons why I don't think that was, a, that was wise. Yeah. So that's just one reason why I, as a pastor, would not stand up and say, yeah. like oh, some of the stuff I've already said just now, some of, if anyone from our, my church watches, they're gonna have never heard me talk about that before yeah. because I don't, I don't talk yeah. about it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I don't think we have to weigh in on the, who's the good guys, the bad guys. Fact is that our reckon, we have a ministry of reconciliation to all the nations, don't we? Yeah. Even those that hate us. That's so. right. So, all right, uh, next one, um, violent crime. Hmm. Hmm. Add to that, we'll add the immigration one to that as well, because I know okay. that they're, they're kind of combined in many yeah. ways. The, yeah. the, the, uh, by immigration, we mean uh, the flood of illegal immigration that's been affecting our country for the last several years, and along with the crime that goes along with that. Is that something that uh, Christians should take a stand on in some ways or speak hmm. to. Can you speak yeah. to that? Yeah. Uh, where we leave off here, David? You know, uh, again, those are, those are both incredibly complex issues when it comes to the political solutions and political handling of them. 
I, I've appreciated um, churches that I've been involved in. Two things that, that churches have done is one, when it comes to um, people coming out of prison, I've liked one church I was part of. They had a ministry where they, uh, both financially and with volunteers, supported mm -hmm. this one home where people were transitioning back into public life from prison. They tried to help them. Mm -hmm. uh, with immigrants, I've, I've appreciated churches I've been a part of that um, work with refugees. Okay, so that's one thing, sort of um, mercy ministry, mm -hmm. loving people. Now, when we talk about the politics of the, both of those things, again, they're incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. I have opinions on both of those, and I, and I don't think, in my personal opinion, I don't think that either political party is, is hitting a bullseye in, in either of those things. I, I would, you know, I, I might agree with some of what, where they're coming from, disagree a little bit, and so you're not gonna hear me uh, preaching about either of those. I, I, in fact, the churches that do would say, we, you know, you need to vote for this political party because of what they think about immigration. I just, I simply disagree. I don't think that churches should do that. Okay. Really not much to add to that, uh, except, uh, you know, the way um, we talk about immigrants is important. Yes, the Bible good, good. Has, Yeah, so that, you know, that, that, if they're demonized or, you know, I've heard kind of terminology like, you know, these people like cockroaches and, or you, you see sometimes um, uh, even politicians speaking about them as really bad people or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's, that's a danger, I yeah. think. I think it's important for us to say, be, all people are made in the image of God, we're called mm -hmm. to love, doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're yeah. here legal or, or illegal or documented or undocumented, and that we should condemn that type of approach to immigration. But again, I, I agree with Dave that the, as far as how we deal with legal immigration um, and, and illegal immigration, those are high, very complex issues that honestly, I, I think I would be out of my depth to really yeah. address, okay. other than to say if there's somebody, you know, in, in my, it doesn't happen too much here in Massachusetts, but let's say you have Border Patrol agents and so forth, that you can encourage them that they're they're meant to follow the law, they're doing a, mm -hmm. a, a good thing, mm -hmm. they're meant to treat these people with respect and so forth, and of course, immigration itself is broader than illegal immigration mm -hmm. and is a huge part of the future of the United States, mm -hmm. undeniably, and we could have a whole conversation, good. we have had a conversation yeah. about yeah. that, yeah. 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 so, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm of all the issues we've discussed so far, I feel like this is one that the Bible does speak very clearly mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned in Romans 13, about the, the ministry of justice and the law and order. Yep. And I think we can speak to that, and I think we should. And I think that's part of what I, when I go into a voting booth, I'm thinking what I want, number one of all, is like I want law and order. Mm -hmm. I want leaders mm -hmm. that I trust who will um, maintain order, because that, that affects my ministry here yeah. of reconciliation. I need there to be peace. Mm -hmm. I need there to be, be able to live quiet lives, and that only happens when uh, the police are taken care of. Mm -hmm. I, I think it is a, um, you know, the defund the police movement. Mm -hmm. That's an abomination as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for whatever reasons they might give for that, that kind of, uh, undermining of law and order is a great concern to me. That's something I, I might very well preach on that, if, if I, especially if it comes to Romans 13, mm. yeah. uh, I might speak to that one. Whereas I don't really, speaking to the economy and foreign policy, those are very tricky and nuanced, but I do think the, the um, law and order is a big deal. Um, and so I might, I might stake my, put my stake in the ground yeah. on that one there, just, yeah. to, just to let, because that, that's, a, that's a big deal. Now who to vote for, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to figure out which party or which politicians serve you best in that area. But I really believe in uh, we need we need law and order because I've seen we've seen the destruction that happens when it's when it's missing. Yeah. Um, uh, one one way that that Christians can address kind of a lot of these is I, I think that um, there's one idea of um, society and of treating wrongdoers, let's say. It, that, that's basically uh, uh, a Christian heresy. Mm. And that is because Christians believe in, say, forgiveness, we believe in grace and mercy. There's, <laughs> there's one uh, political philosophy that, that looks at that and agrees with that, and that to the exclusion of the Bible's um, emphasis also sort of uh, held in tension with that, that of human responsibility, of the, of the necessity of, of order, of you know the goodness of of laws, yeah. so that's something that I think you can address directly, and that's that applies to immigration. It a, a, applies to crime. Um, so there's a yeah. so that might be a way to to talk about that. And I, I never have, um, mm. but but I could see doing that. Especially well, one of the things is 
I think because our culture has been, has had such a strong Christian inheritance, mm. we've not needed to address some of these practical, like, the, like, like handling crime and, and, mm. and, and borders, for example. There, there are biblical things you can say about those things that we didn't, didn't say probably because we assume, we all assumed the same thing. Yeah. But as certain people are, are, a lot of people are getting further and further from those, those ideals, there will be a place, I think, for us to think about them. And I probably yeah. haven't thought about them, and I certainly haven't taught about them yeah. before. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and part of uh, uh, me, too, is like, again, the, the, do your job. It's sort of like I, I'm, when the state does its job and maintains, just, just maintain the laws. That's all. Yeah. You know, don't have to add more laws to it. Just maintain our laws. Yeah. That enables us to minister with reconciliation, to care for the the refugees to care for all those that are mm -hmm. struggling that are you know and and bringing the gospel of forgiveness of sins and good news to the to to all peoples uh, but when when the government fails on that point uh, it's chaos and division and strife and struggles and everyone lives is miserable and the gospel is is hampered mm -hmm. it will certainly go forward but um, Paul says pray for that specifically yeah. so yeah all right Last one. Uh, there's plenty more, but this is one more. Uh, abortion. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. That's a big one this time around. Uh, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, now it's a battle for the states, and, uh, uh, and there's a certain parties certainly think that this is the winner for them, uh, mm -hmm. that abortion. Mm -hmm. um, should that issue, we've talked a little bit about it, but Rick, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, should it matter, and how... What kind of a stance should this? We we, we all agree that we are a, a, opposed to that. In fact, we're you know it's even in our faith and message statements for our churches that we oppose this. How how should the church address that issue? Uh, you know, I think it, a, a lot of this has to do with uh, proportion. So how how much of my focus is on my take, helping my, our local pregnancy care center? How much is it on ministering to moms in our community, single moms in our community? Um, it, how much is it on addressing issues of the, the of life, and you know, and then how much is on the legal issues? And I think it, it sometimes it's, it's it's put out of proportion that we're, we're, so much focus is put on the legal issue, uh, and instead of really changing hearts. Mm -hmm. my, so my primary focus, and I'm, I'm not going to dodge the. The legal issue, but my primary focus is to, is to change hearts. That all people, you know, culture of life, all people are made in the image of God, invaluable. That uh, life begins at conception, um, and then that move from there to the idea that shouldn't there be legal protections for people who are made in the image of God and who exist, who have, who are have value, who have uh, you know a soul. So mm -hmm. I think you move from one to the other. Um, but just to be, I, I wouldn't want um, my church to be known as the the, the pro-life uh, sort of um, legal, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. advocate. Like that's what yeah, we're right. known for. I want us to be known for the gospel. Mm -hmm. And by the way, yes, of course we stand for, for life. Yeah. You know, that, that's, I guess, so just proportional. Um, uh, we are, pro, I think the church should be pro-life and should say, well, I'm enshrining a law um, that condones any type of murder, which is the taking of yeah. a life immorally, would be wrong. So we, yeah. should, we should be able to say that, mm -hmm. not be afraid to say that. Yeah. But what people should sense from us is a love for people of all ages. And so are we, are we doing anything yeah. to actually advocate for life? You know? do, so, you, do you ever preach on abortion? On abortion, yes. On um, the legal, whether, whether abortion should be legal or illegal, I think I have mentioned it, but not to the same uh, degree. So I would have no problem talking about how God has made us in the, in the womb. You know, he's knit us together. All people are made in the image of God. Jesus, you know, uh, when he was in the, in the womb and met John the Baptist who was in the womb, he leapt, at, you know, for joy at, at Jesus' uh, um, presence, the miracle of, of a child, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think I've made connections uh, uh, to the legal question often enough, I think. Mm -hmm. so. But I think you can talk about whether this is right or wrong first. Yeah. Then talk about the legal. And there is, you know, there are some who would say, well, it's illi it's immoral. I agree, but I am I, I don't think it should be against the law. And I would, you know, I try to make connections there and say, well, is 
in murder, is murder in general something that should be against the law? I think that is probably the one primary role of the state is to make sure yeah. you can, no, one person can't kill another. So doesn't that apply to this issue? And try to make that sort of theological connection. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. How about you, Dave? You ever you ever preach on this issue? You know, I think I only have once. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I think it's good to preach on it. It's 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 really important. Um, it's you know, it's a travesty that mm -hmm. uh, it's dangerous to be alive in your mother's womb. Yeah. Um, and I'm not primarily convinced on that from the scriptures. I'm primarily convinced on that from from medicine, from biology, from embryology. You know, yeah. I mean, it's. It's someone else's heart. It's someone else's limbs in the in the womb. Uh, uh, you know, you don't need the Bible to, mm -hmm. to know that. And we should care about life. That's not the number one thing we should care about. The number one thing we should care about is we want people to, to know Christ. But we also should be should care about people and and even mm -hmm. people that aren't born yet. We should care about them and love them and protect them if we're able. So, yeah. yeah. Um, to you, Dave. Do you can a person be a faithful Christian and vote for a pro-choice candidate. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're I think they're mistaken, but there's no I would not at all say you know you you can't be. Uh, you, well, obviously you're not a Christian since you voted that way. I mean, I um, I in fact I know people who are Christians who who will vote who are voting pro-choice candidates and uh, I mean pro yeah pro-choice. I I strongly disagree, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, you know, the pe people think differently, they reason differently, and um, so, yeah. How about that, Rick? Would, yeah. what, what do you think about that? So I would think, similar to Dave, I'd say that uh, you could be a faithful Christian. I think you are inconsistent on that issue. Yeah. And, and so if, let's say some, someone, you know, was a strong Christian and that's what they, they came to me and said, hey, I don't think this should be, I think abortion should be legal, and they were open to a conversation about that. I would try to show them how that's inconsistent but I wouldn't say you're not a Christian or even that you're not a faithful Christian or mature Christian. I just think mm. on this issue, have you really thought through what that would mean mm. to say that some life is not to be protected by our state, by yeah. our government, that some life is less than life, less yeah. than other lives? And is that really what we as Christians want to promote? So mm. I think you could have that conversation with them. So people can be faithful Christians and inconsistent. I'm sure I'm inconsistent in some beliefs in some areas yeah, as well. Yeah. So I, I would love to have that conversation with a person who says, I believe the Bible is the word of God. I take very seriously my faith in the Lord, in the Lord, but this is what I believe. If they're open to a conversation, I'd love to have that conversation yeah. with them, you know, yeah. and, and talk about why. I don't think you can end up and be faithful to what the scripture says and end up saying, but this should be allowed as, the, as an exception that that allows murder. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I just thought of something that I, I don't think I've thought of before, and it's probably pretty controversial, and it may be uh, uh, disagree with what I was just saying about how people vote. Mm. But it, say, say there was someone that came to our church and was a politician who is actually making the law, and say they're wanting to make a, a pro choice law, w or let's say they were an abortion doctor, yeah. for example. I think in either of those cases, this is my off the cuff after having given it 30 seconds of thought. Okay. <laughs> I, I think it, it, for that, in that case, as a, if they were part of my church, they were a member of our church, that they would be, I think, I would consider doing exercising church discipline on them, that that, that, that is, uh, they're, they're engaged in immoral activity in that yeah. case. Sure. I think that's different than voting, because yeah. voting is, a, your vote, it's a variety of things on the table. Yeah. Yeah. But if, it, if they were more directly involved in it, I'd say that that is really wrong and, yeah. and should not be done by a Christian. Yeah, that's interesting. Voting is, is, is tricky. Uh, what is it, uh, who is it? Was it ben Franklin said uh, that uh, politics is the art of the possible? Mm -hmm. And so you, you know, the, the, you're not gonna get your ideals here, and Thomas Sowell, one of my favorite lines is, there, there are no solutions, there's only trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to figure this thing out, and there, mm -hmm. there are certain sort of strategies, so that uh, I might, there might be the, the, the anti-abortion candidate, the pro-life candidate is, I might feel like he doesn't have a chance of winning this election because of the climate. So I might go with the more pro-choice guy because he's, or a pro, I should say pro-abortion guy, because you know at least he, he has a chance of winning versus the violently radical pro-abortion person that he'd be running against. And so you kind of pick your poison here, try to figure this out. Do I want to keep my ideals and just keep losing every election? Or at what point do I need to say, give me the best guy I can and try to make a little progress. Instead of getting the touchdown, can we get a first down at least? Can we move the ball a little bit? 
I think I agree with that. And and again, not to, to disagree with Dave, um, who's only thought of it for 30 seconds, <laughs> admittedly. Uh, yeah, so uh, someone, I can certainly imagine someone saying, look, I'm a, uh, as a politician in this setting, there is no, there is no, if I if I if I come out and say I am I'm I'm going to work towards you know abolishing all abortion rights or whatever, that's a death sentence. There's no way forward, and that politics is the art of compromise. That's different than the abortion doctor. <coughs> I would definitely think the abortion doctor um, would be under church discipline, but I wouldn't necessarily the, say that the politician um, who was pro-choice would necessarily be under church discipline. So I think okay. I dis because yeah. of what Michael just said, th th politics is. It's the art of compromise. Yeah. They're, they, they're, they're constantly yeah. trading off on things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you got to do in order to get things done. I agree, I agree with you. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't know. I'd probably kick them out. But <laughs> Even after what you said, you still was <laughs> <laughs> All right. We only have a couple minutes, so just real oh. quick here. Final thoughts. <clears throat> Two Christians today, as we're heading to the booths, one, just 30 seconds, what's your message to, to a believer as he's heading into this election? Who wants to go first? Oh, man. Pray. I, I, I'd say pray and, and that, and most importantly, I'd say God is absolutely sovereign. Mm -hmm. And um, um, this, this election does not take God off his throne. God's gonna, God is going to be on his throne in November and December and January, no matter what. Um, I, I think that's the main thing I would say. Yeah, especially since we're just at the yeah. end here. So, Super. yeah. Rick? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, go vote. I think that's a good thing for a Christian to do, be engaged in the political process. I think, you know, take seriously your role as a citizen. But trust that, you know, whatever end, how it, whatever it ends up being, if it goes the, a different direction than, um, than you expected, that God is a sovereign God, as similarly we said, Dave, and that you know, I'm going to go about my life. I'm going to love my wife. I'm going to love my kids. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go to my job, and life will continue on. I'll be faithful we're, our faithfulness as Christians is not depending dependent at all on who sits in the in the White House, or even whether we have an antagonistic government towards Christianity. Mm -hmm. If anything, that's a calling to be more you know to be faithful in the, in the face of uh, opposition. Yeah. So, do your best to love your neighbor by voting because that is loving our neighbor here, and then just continue to live out the Christian life. Yeah, yeah. That's a good word. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good word. And I would just say too, it's like I'd say, pray, think about the issues, forget about the personalities, just think about the issues you were concerned about. Be unashamed. You're always going to be choosing the lesser of two evils. You don't have to defend. Just make your choice. Vote boldly with joy. And don't worry. God is in control, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And then get back to our real work, which is the Ministry of Reconciliation. Mm -hmm. so, so with that, thank you, uh, men, and thank you for tuning in. Uh, may we all continue to grow in the love of God the Father and the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit. God bless you, and we'll see you next time on Crossroads. Thank you.